Good morning. Thank you, Jim. Psalm 71, 8. Psalm 71, 8. My mouth is filled with thy praise and thy glory all day long. You know, if God's praise and his glory is in our mouth all days long, it's a good thing we got started early this morning. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we invite your spirit to be with us today. We pray that you would be with all those volunteers who give of their time and their talent for your service in your church. We would pray for our pastor as he brings us encouraging words. And Heavenly Father, for every soul in this sanctuary, we would pray that you would open our hearts, touch our minds, and move us to service with your spirit. And we would be so bold as to tell you thank you in advance for hearing our prayers, for we ask this in the most precious, most powerful name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let's stand and sing.
Welcome to Lincoln Community Church. We are glad that you joined us together, and most of us are members here, but if today is your first day, while most of the members call this church home, we want to tell you, welcome home. And uh, by the way, if, uh, if you did not know this, you have been prayed for today. Pastor and I and the staff, we pray for you every single day. And if we're in your prayers, we would ask that you would be reminded to keep us in your prayers. We want to remember some anniversaries. Marilyn Mac, Marilyn and Mac Hunter will be celebrating their 57th wedding anniversary today. And the flowers here are from Rich and Penny Kauser. They'll be celebrating their 58th wedding anniversary last week. And last year, Penny and I were talking about husbands and wives. And uh, she talked about her husband, Rich. She said, you know, he's going to be rich as long as he has a penny. <laughs> Good one, Penny. That wasn't even one of mine. So, good. We, we want to tell these couples that uh, we are very grateful that God has blessed you um, for so many, many years. This is my friend Van Banghart. Everybody say hi, Van. Hi, Van. Go ahead and raise your hand so people can see it. Yeah. Last Saturday, Van turned 90 years old. And so I said, Van, what are you going to do for your birthday? He said, Jody, I, I've never had one in my entire life. He said, I'm thinking about getting a tattoo. <laughs> I said, you're thinking about getting a tattoo of what? He said, at 90 years old, I'm thinking about getting my name and my address. <laughs> so we'll see about that. Tonight at 4 p.m. is our movie night. It's a wonderful time of fellowship. We see a very nice movie, and then everyone who comes gets an ice cream. And every good communicator always has a visual aid. And so this morning I brought a visual aid. It is a ice cream wrapper for a Hagen Doss chocolate and almond bar. And you might think, uh, Pastor, well, where did you get that uh, wrapper for a, uh, an ice cream bar? And I might tell you, it's none of your business. <laughs> it starts at 4 o'clock tonight, and we pray that you just come here, watch a movie, and enjoy some fellowship uh, with us. Next Sunday, after the worship service, there is a meeting for the people who are interested in a short-term um, missionary program. We go down to the Central Valley city of Dinuba. Um, it, the date of the trip is the 20th through the 25th. It's a safe, comfortable Christian ministry. Literally, we pack eight ounce soup packages that go around the world. And they send out millions and millions of these packages uh, every year. There is a quilting shop. There are duties to take care of inside and outside, just plain maintenance. There's plenty of fat, uh, food. There's plenty of activity. There's time for rest. We stay in comfortable rooms, and there are RV hookups if you happen to have an RV, and it only costs us $20 a day to serve the Lord. And there's a list of the people who have gone on before us. And so the meeting is next Sunday and the Sunday after that, Jim and Mary Vaughn will host that meeting. If you're interested at all to see what we do, uh, please uh, join the, uh, the meeting next Sunday. Um, you can see that we're set up for the Lord's Supper uh, today. And so uh, we want to read the Apostle Paul's account of the, uh, uh, the Lord's Supper. It's found in 1 Corinthians 11. The Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And while we join in the Lord's Supper to remember his death, it is not his death that brings us into the kingdom of heaven. It is his resurrection. Amen? Amen. God be praised. Uh, we hope that you'll continue to stay with us uh, as we join the Lord's Supper. We want to remember God's family in a prayer. We want to give thanks for those answered prayer. And we want to make intercession on those family members that we know so, uh, so well and close. Cindy's granddaughter, Kate, is out of the hospital and she is back at school. It's a 14-year-old girl who is in the hospital for more than a week. The doctor said she can do whatever she wants to, and her parents said, what do you want to do? And she said, I got to get back to school. And so we tell God, thank you. Thank you for hearing our prayers. There is never more heartfelt prayer than that of, for our children and our grandchildren. We also want to remember Giovanni, Giovanni Kenzie. She's still in a care facility. She's not having an easy time, and both her parents passed away last year. And so we would pray that somehow God would take this ugly situation and make it beautiful. That God's grace would fall upon Giovanni. Giovanni. And then, uh, where's my... Uh, where's... <laughs> Sherry Walker, where are you? Where are you hiding? There you go. Sherry Walker. Everybody say hi, Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Um, I don't mean to get in people's business, but she's been having a most difficult fight with cancer for the last four years. And she came to Bible study last week, and I said, how are you today? She said, the doctor said my numbers are up, and they're up dramatically. And I said, well, what in the world are you doing here? She said, I could sit at home and be depressed, or I could come and be close to the Lord. And again, she's here today. May God smile on you. And may we take encouragement from our sisters. <laughs> this week, uh, Pastor Mike's wife, Diane, will be going to Southern California. We want to pray for a safe trip for her as well. And so as I've mentioned a couple of these people to you, the Lord, the Lord might have made mention of someone to you, a neighbor, a family member, a friend. And so I'm going to ask Jim to play quietly. And then I'm going to ask you to bring that person to the altar of God. And then after just a moment, allow me to pray for all of us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our church. We thank you for every member. We thank you for our volunteers and our elders. We would tell you thank you for Sherry Walker. Heavenly Father, she is the one who directs our path. And Heavenly Father, we pray that your healing hand would be upon her. We pray that somehow, some way, you would re remind our sister that she is your favorite daughter and that she never walks alone. We would ask that you would unite us together and bring us together as one family with you as our Father. We would ask that you would bless our offering, bless the gift, bless the giver, as you move us forward to the path that you have for us. And Lord, we would ask that you would bless Pastor Mike and Steve and Dawn as they have words rightly spoken to encourage our hearts this morning. We ask that you would answer our prayers for the glory of your name as we recite the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forevermore. Amen. cross Christ will keep you there comfort he waits for you listen to his voice kneel with him your care and begin life anew kneel at the cross kneel at the cross just come and leave every care oh leave every care come and kneel at cross, kneel at the cross, Jesus will meet you there, meet you there. Kneel at the cross, there is room for all who his glory share. Bliss there awaits, harm will ne'er befall those who are hankered there. Kneel at the cross, kneel at the cross, just come and leave every Appreciate that. All right. Appreciate Jody praying for and having you pray for Diane. She will be leaving on uh, Tuesday. Our, our, and you can remember, our youngest daughter, I think she's sung here for us a few times, she and her husband are going and taking a church in Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, <laughs> Susie went to school in the Midwest, so she knows snow, but my son-in-law has never been out of Southern California. <laughs> So Diane's going down and helping them pack and everything. So you might just remember my wife over the next couple of weeks. And uh, thank you, Jody, for praying for him today. Anyway, it's a privilege for me today to welcome Steve and Don Liberty. And we're going to do something a little different today. Steve and Don, come on up here. We're going to move our uh, chairs up. And uh, we're just going to have a little sit-down talk here. I'll push them all up there. All righty. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Let's make sure they all work. This one's green, so I'm just That's gonna... green, yeah. That one's wrapped in green and made for a team. You know, be... Do any of you remember the old Dick Clark show on Saturday nights? And it was Beech Nut Spearmint Gum. Wrapped in green and made for a team. My wife gets so upset with me that I keep saying that thing. <laughs> she says, you remember all the dumb stuff in life. <laughs> and she doesn't go on to say I don't remember the important things, but anyway. Um, I'll set this right here for now. Okay. Well, Steve and Don, we've been supporting you guys how long now? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a while, and uh, they are, why don't you just tell people about who you're serving with and just a little bit about Proclaim International and what they do. Here's another one. This one's got a... This one's green. Okay, and that one's This green. one's off. Okay, okay. Here we go. Yeah, at least a dozen years, I think, so. Okay. Yeah, well, um, I, if I may start with something else, Pastor. Sure, sure, fire away. Mike, uh, Don and I, it's really important to us 
to just communicate our gratitude and our thanks to not only you, Pastor Mike, but the leadership team and certainly the missions committee and, of course, this body of Christ for uh, the last, yeah, 12 years of partnership. So, you know, we know that we have been prayed for um, consistently and the, the partnership that we've enjoyed in uh, moving, advancing the gospel around the world just means everything to us. So just thank you. Thank you all for uh, just your love and your care and your support. So Proclaim, if, if you didn't know, um, we're a, a small mission based out of uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and it's an evangelistic ministry. Typically, the short version is that we, um, we help under-resourced uh, small under-resourced churches, typically in really difficult places of the world. And we come alongside them and provide training, and then we help them with evangelism outside the walls of the church. We're trying to help them get outside into the community to build relationships and ultimately have opportunities to make disciples with people that they wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to engage with. And we use different means to help the church do that. Uh, sometimes it's creative arts. Sometimes it's uh, life skills that we're teaching to the, com uh, to the children in some communities and young adults. So it's essentially an evangelistic ministry, sharing the gospel in the public forum. Okay. Now, Don, you guys were in Germany. It's where you were kind of home-based. Yes, we've been in Germany for the last 10 years. And then you have two daughters. Correct. That were there with you for a while, and then uh, one of them went off to Taylor University. Yep. And then the other one went to, to Taylor, Taylor University, University. and, and yeah. they're both there now. Correct. Okay. They're a sophomore and a junior. All right. And... Yeah. And one of them is going to get married in a year. Yes, one oh, just got proposed to um, in December, mm -hmm. and um, she they plan on getting married um, in May of 2023 when oh, they graduate. Right. Well, terrific, so, terrific. Sophia's the one with the curly hair. Bianca's the one with the straight hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now, you, you know, your ministry took you away from... Maybe some was in Germany, but I know a lot of the Balkan countries. Tell us a little bit about that, Steve. I'm, I'm the guy with no hair, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, as we were based in Germany these last 10 years, um, our ministry focus was in the Balkan Peninsula, and that, that's basically old Yugoslavia, Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, Albania, Albania uh, Macedonia. And uh, so we were involved in local and regional ministry in Germany as well, but our main focus was uh, uh, serving churches in, in the Balkans. And now that we're in Jacksonville uh, as a base, we've been reassigned to Jacksonville, Florida, which is the home of our U.S. office, that ministry will absolutely continue. So uh, we're not abandoning our partners in uh, the Balkan Peninsula. In fact, I'll be going next month for a missions conference, a great opportunity for networking, and then again in June for Croatia and Serbia outreach campaign. And so that will remain the same, Pastor Mike. All right. Uh, if, if I may, just a couple of new things that will be added to some of our uh, responsibilities and opportunities are... Um, we have come to the conclusion as a ministry, and this is not a news flash, but there are huge opportunities here in the United States of America, yeah? Amen. So we live in a, in a current uh, social and political climate where there's you know, deep division and polarization, and certainly with COVID, you know, kind of a lack of security in people's minds and a lack of hope and what does the future look like? And so what has historically been a focus on international ministry with Proclaim, we are pursuing opportunities and have already uh, begun the process of serving churches here in America. Uh, part of our other responsibilities are a, uh, a really uh, hard and intentional focus on recruiting young people because we have to train a new generation of kingdom workers you know, as, as we get a little bit older. I know I look really good, but, you know, I am getting, I'm getting a little older. And Don has a new responsibility in Florida as well. Yeah, I am actually been training since we landed in March. Um, 
I'm in charge of all the finance in, for, for our mission organization. So uh, donor management, um, payroll, anything to do with finance, that's my new role. All right. I, I was going to add, you know, there's a lot of um, intersections in his li their life and, and, my, and my life and, and Diane's life that, that we've discovered over time. I mean, ministry in Croatia, which is interesting because my dad's dad came from Croatia at the turn of the 20th century. So, you know, that's about as much as I know. But, uh, but the other interesting thing is, you know, you guys are out of the Oak Church down in uh, Balsam. And one of your close friends is David Holcomb. Yeah. Well, <laughs> David's dad and I went to seminary at the same time together. We lived in houses right next to each other. And David is the same age as my oldest daughter, Julie. And they were just little bitty babies and kids growing up. So here we are, you know, meeting each other in interesting ways. Mm. You know, so our, our paths are crossed in a lot of, yep. uh, a lot of ways mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. Maybe what you could talk about, Steve, a little bit, because you guys have had a lot of opportunity to minister there in the Balkans and I mean, and, and Germany, and I think you did, even down in North Africa a few times. Yeah, that's me. Yeah, <laughs> and. Uh, what I would like you to share with us a little bit here is um, what were some times that you faced some situations, ministry-wise, where you, it just seemed like the obstacles and opposition was there, and you just said, there's no way this is going to work. And yet, to your total surprise, God showed up and made it all possible. Can you share a little bit about that? Well, yeah. Uh, I would say not only did God show up, but... You know, we have, we have to have confidence that God is there before I show up and while we're there and certainly after we leave. So there have been many, many times uh, over these past years where we've faced um, obstacles and, you know, heavy antagonism towards the gospel uh, in various countries. Um, but, you know, one of the things that uh, I have to remember is that as you as you said, and I think as you're going to speak on a little bit later, is that God is in control. And I, I don't have to have a false sense of pressure on myself to seal the deal when I'm in front of somebody and have an opportunity to engage with someone and witness to someone. You know, I, I have a confidence that the Holy Spirit is, has been working, is working, and will continue to work in the lives of people um, I encounter. So, but I did want to share, there's a story uh, that's told actually by a colleague. Um, and, you know, we never really know how God is working. We know he is, but we're not sure how always. And certainly, you know, Don and I, we don't always get to see the fruit of the evangelism. You know, sometimes we leave and we hear reports, great reports, but, you know, God is at work for sure. Um, the story is, is that uh, a colleague of ours uh, was in the London area some number of years ago, and uh, they had a big uh, public outreach partnering with uh, several uh, pastoral association, a number of churches. And uh, the day of the event came, and thousands of people showed up. Quite, quite extraordinary, particularly for that particular culture, you know, sort of a media-saturated culture. But the next day, they also had another event planned. And so, you know, the day that they had the thousands of people, they're very excited. Oh, God's working. You know, look at all the people that came. They're going to hear the gospel and, you know, praise the Lord. Well, the next day, uh, they had this event planned in a park. And the weather turned bad, and it was raining and wet and foggy, and there was a number of people who were uh, trying to actually stop the event from happening. So they had some, you know, some issues with people um, who weren't necessarily appreciating what they were trying to do. So they went ahead with the event, and in their own minds, maybe as we think sometimes, we're like, well... What a waste, you know. I mean, hardly no one showed up, and, you know, how's God glorified in, in this kind of a scenario? So they went on with the event. They, they were using music to attract people, and then they were sharing the gospel message straight and clear and boldly. And they walked away from the event and, you know, kind of shaking their heads. But what happened a number of years later was this particular colleague 
maybe 20 years later, he was at a missions conference, and a gentleman walked up to him and said, hi, I don't, you probably don't know me, and you probably don't know who I am, but, and I'm trying not to get choked up, because this story always moves me, but he, he said, I was at a particular concert in London on a day when it was raining and foggy, and I was standing back by a tree, and you shared the gospel, and I got saved that day. And now I'm a pastor, and I pastor a church here in America. And so it's just a powerful, powerful story and a powerful reminder about how God can work in just what appears to be huge, you know, uh, challenges, mm. you know, and, and certainly, you know, we can give glory to God for those kinds of stories. And so it's an amazing thing. It reminds me of Isaiah's words in Isaiah 55, 11. Uh, My word will not return to me void without accomplishing that which I sent it forth to do. And uh, well, I never doubt that any time you, you share the good news and uh, share what God's done in your life, it has impact. Don, any particular things that, you know, in, in your time, uh, there in Germany raising the girls and, and uh, anything that just sticks out for you? I, actually, I think it's more um, in South Africa. Some, uh, some of the stories that I, I tend to do life skills, and so I go to South Africa. We have a life skills team, actually, that's going there right now. Um, and I teach sewing to young children and um, happen to teach sewing to some moms because they would drop off their little kids in the morning and, and they wanted to learn. And so, um, but I think f for me, it was these moms, the impact that I had on these moms that were learning to sew, and I had gone there two years in a row, and um, they we had bought sew machines and left them at this center for so that they could continue to use them. And I just encouraged them, a couple of them, that they needed to, um, I was hoping that they would to, um, yeah, to continue the sewing program with the kids. So I, I encourage them to give back to their own community and keep the program going while I wasn't there. And, and they did that until, of course, COVID hit. But, mm -hmm. but it was just, it was, it was seeing God show up or, or having God work through me and identifying people in that community yeah. that continue to give back to their own community. That's neat. That's neat. So. Well, you guys are here now. You're down in Jacksonville, and I need to pray that you're spared from the alligators and the Burmese <laughs> pythons and everything else. No. But I'm wondering what we could be praying for you guys about at this point. Are there any particular things you might share with us? For me, it's, I mean, we're, we're settled in, and the girls have made it their home, which is great. So they're, they want to come to Jacksonville yeah. from Indiana. Um, but for me, it's, it's connection. Now it's like, you know, it, we're not in a, a community of people where, you know, we've connected to a church, and now it's just the time and the connection to people there. And I think that's, that's for that's me. That's important for all of us. Yeah. yeah. Steve, yeah. I'll let you. Yeah, well, there's, um, uh, there's huge opportunities. Um, for us uh, as a ministry and as, as, a, and as missionaries with Proclaim. So I would just ask for prayer for as we, uh, as a mission, begin to explore particularly opportunities to serve churches in the United States, that God would lead us to uh, people and, and that we would uh, be able to just serve local churches here in America. And then also you can certainly be praying for our daughters. Um, uh, in, in their studies at Taylor. And then lastly, I would say prayer for our elderly parents um, whose uh, care needs are increasing. We want to honor our parents, you know, well. And, uh, you know, we're closer now in Florida than we were in Germany. But, uh, so yeah, they, they're doing well. But yeah, prayer for, prayer for our parents would be wonderful. Well, listen, I want you both to know how much we love you guys. And, and man, for me personally, because I've gotten to know you guys really well, and, 
it's been a great privilege for me and Diane to count you guys as friends. But as a church here, we thank you for your faithfulness, for the example you are to us. And we will continue to keep praying for you and uh, keep looking forward to hearing what God's doing. So thank you. And I'm going to let them go back and sit down. They, they have another member of the family here today. Yeah. They have a, a little dog, and I've never heard. It's a Morky. Yeah. And that doesn't mean they came from the planet Orc. <laughs> It's a Maltese and a Yorkie, and he is the cutest, quietest, well-behaved little dog. Oh, my goodness. But thank you, guys, really. It's wonderful. Well, and you'll get a chance to talk to them a little bit more, you know, after the service, and I hope you do. It's just, just a, what a wonderful choice couple this is. Um, you know, as I thought about what I wanted to do, because I had wanted to get into a series in Philippians, which I'm going to be doing, but I'm only going to take about 10 minutes this morning. Of course, any time a pastor says only 10 minutes, you're in trouble. But, uh, but um, I wanted to do a series of studies in Philippians. But then I thought about what we were talking about today and a little bit of what we shared. And, you know, where I want to start with in this just kind of an introduction to this wonderful little epistle, and it's one of my favorites, is letting God be in control, especially when your world seems out of control. And I think we'd all say, boy, these last two or three years, it's been kind of crazy, isn't it? And, uh, and yet ministry is that way so often. And Steve and Don have just shared a little bit with you that way. And, uh, and I keep telling people, they say, what's it been like to keep pastoring during this period of time? And I said, well, it feels a little like I'm on the dance floor and the DJ keeps changing the tune. I got to change my step about every five minutes. And, and that's just the way it's been with this whole COVID thing. But uh, but you know, the thing you learn, and this is what this wonderful epistle is all about that, God is constantly in control. The Apostle Paul talked as he, he kind of laid out this whole book. It, it's really a, about a lot of contrast. And uh, the first chapter is going to be about discouragement versus encouragement. Uh, second chapter talks about self-importance versus self-sacrifice, and especially the humiliation of Christ and yet his exaltation. Uh, Paul will talk about his own sense of personal loss. That uh, you know, where I counted as game, I count as loss for the sake of knowing Christ. That eternal gain, uh, worry versus peace, and uh, disappointment versus anointment, and finally hope versus certainty. It's it's all in this epistle. These contrasts. But the thing that makes it so possible is is the joy that pervades this book. And uh, the word joy or rejoice, it appears 14 different times in the book of Philippians, and, and at least once in every single chapter. And it's about the joy of overcoming these, these contrasts. Now, those of you who are looking at the notes, I want you to relax, because somebody out there is probably saying, but you skipped one of them. No, I didn't. Here it is. It's the first one. And... Uh, and, and what it is in the first chapter, and, and for me, this is, this is almost the theme of the whole book. Opposition versus opportunity, or maybe we'd say obstacles versus opportunity, or just stuff. Stuff's the things that happen to you when you're on the way to doing something else, right? And COVID has been that way, hasn't it? But you know what? The, the great record of this book that Paul gives to you is about how God has used it for opportunities. So let's talk about Paul for a minute here. One of the things that a great apostle wanted more than anything else was to get to Rome. In Romans 1.15, when he's writing to Romans, he says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. More than anything else, he wanted to go there and be able to bring the message to the, to the most important city in the whole world. But it didn't quite... He, he got there. Obviously, the book of Philippians... He's in Rome, and he is under house arrest. I'll talk about that in a minute. And the Philippian church, they're concerned about him. That's why he's writing back to them. So he did get there, not quite the way he planned it. And uh, how did it happen? Well, the last few chapters of Acts, it tells us he had gone back to Jerusalem. He was wanted to bring the message to, to, to the people of uh, Jerusalem, and, and he's in the temple area, and he, he wants to speak to the priests, and all it does is get him in trouble got in such a mess that, that the Roman authorities took him under uh, arrest to, to protect him, among other things. And eventually he ends up down on the coast in Caesarea where the governor is. And he spends actually a couple years there. 
And uh, the, the, the rabbi, the Jewish priests, they all want to have him brought back to Jerusalem so they can kill him. And they tell the governor, this guy, he's seditious. He's, he's, he's creating or committing treason. And this is what Paul says. Look, if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, and they're not, no one has the right to hand me over to them. Why was that? Because Paul was a Roman citizen. And because of that, this is what he says. I appeal to Caesar. Now, they had a law in those days in the Roman Empire. If you were a Roman citizen, I didn't care what the case was, uh, you could appeal your case to, to Caesar. And they could, you'd have to go to Rome at your own expense, but you'd go there and you could appeal your case before Caesar. So the governor says, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. And off he goes. And eventually, when we get to the 28th chapter, he ends up in Rome. This is what it says in the 16th verse. When he got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself, rented quarters. He had to rent it himself with a soldier to guard him. Uh, it wasn't just to guard him. He, the, the soldier uh, would be shackled to Paul, and Paul couldn't go anywhere. Well, anyway, he ends up there, and it tells us at the end of this 28th chapter, Luke is recording this. He says, for two whole years, Paul stayed in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. However, <laughs> somebody was there listening, the Roman guard. Paul would say, wow, man, I had a captive audience. This guy's chained to me. He can't get away. And that's true. Every day, his dad probably have a different one of the guards with him. And uh, he'd hear this guy talking about Jesus over and over again. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Well, the Philippians, he's writing back to the Philippian church, and this is what he's saying to them. Look, I don't want you to worry. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. That I, everybody, uh, as a result, has become clear throughout the whole Praetorian Guard, and the Praetorian Guard, we could say today in our own terminology, the Secret Service. They were the ones that guarded Caesar's household. So throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, they have heard, I am in chains for Christ. It's given great opportunities. And because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. And they're looking at Paul. He's chained to a Roman guard. He's, he's been here. He's going to appear before Nero, and yet he's still talking about Jesus. Hey, well, we can do it too. He even adds these words. <laughs> Some preach out of envy and rivalry. Some are trying to one-up me. Yeah, it's okay. What does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Man, what a magnanimous spirit in this guy, Paul. All that matters to him is that Jesus is proclaimed. Stuff happens, but God uses it for good. That's one of the great themes in this book. Well, that happens over and over in life. A lot of you have read the book, uh, Hiding Place by Corey Ten Boom. Maybe you saw the movie. <coughs> you know that Corey Ten Boom and her family lived in Holland as the Nazi invasion came, and they were hiding Jewish people in their house for a number of years until somebody ratted on them, and the whole family then was taken by the Gestapo put into a concentration camp. They all died except for Corey. One of the places that Corey and her sister, Betsy, were put was in Ravensbrück concentration camp, 1944 to 1945. In that camp, and they were just packed in there, because of the fleas and the lights, the guards wouldn't even enter. Thus, Corey and Betsy were able to have Bible studies, worship, and prayer. Out of that, she tells a story in her book, hiding place. Out of that, many women found hope in Christ. See, what seemed like a terrible obstacle, horrible opposition, stuff that happens, God did some magnificent things, didn't he? Well, that's what he goes on to talk about in Philippians 4. And this is the best part of the whole book. When you come to the last few verses, this is what he says. Greet every saint in Christ. This is always Paul sending greetings at the end. And the brethren who are here with me, they send you greetings. All the saints send greetings. Now watch this next line. 
especially those who belong to Caesar's household. You ever see that before? Most of the time you get to the end of something, read, okay, I'm going to go to the next chapter now. You know, you don't pay attention to it. But especially the saints in Caesar's household. Who was Caesar? Anybody? Nero. Nero. And you know what historians tell us, that wasn't a great household to be in. He ultimately killed his mother-in-law, killed his wife, killed a number of other people. Uh, <laughs> it was his way or the highway. And uh, not pleasant. And yet somehow, every day, these guards would come back. They had to pull duty. Oh, okay, it's my turn to go down there and spend time with this guy, Paul. And he's a motor mouth, never stops talking about this Jesus. But after a while, some things start connecting. And they're going back up to the household. And it is frightening in that household with Nero. And maybe one of these guards says, well, my lady, let me tell you about something I'm hearing down there. Or, sir, let me tell you about something. And the, the gospel trickles up to the household. And some of those people are getting saved. That's the great message of God's work. There's a Genesis, Genesis principle, I call it, 50 verse 20. It's that passage where, if you know the Old Testament, where Joseph, who was sold into slavery by his brothers, and then he gets down to Egypt, and he becomes second in command in Egypt, and uh, uh, eventually his brothers come down there, and they're looking for food, and they finally discover who he is. And, and uh, kind of at the end of things, they're worried that, that Joseph's going to even the score. And Joseph says, don't be afraid. He said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish the saving of many lives. I love this. We can rejoice. The book of Philippians is about the fact that we can rejoice because even when evil stuff happens, God uses it for good, doesn't he? Yes, he does. And you know, we've gone through a couple of years now where it, this has been crazy. Um, people have acted crazy. And you, and you wonder, where is this all going? I don't know. But God is still at work. God is still at work. He takes evil stuff and he turns it to his good. Another verse in the Bible we all know, Romans 8, 28, God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. And that, that's the great theme in a nutshell in this whole wonderful book that's all about joy. It's because God never stops working in our lives. And I don't know what you have been through. I know what this like last couple of years has been like for me. It's not been easy doing ministry. But, but you know what? In the midst of all this, I keep hearing stories. I keep hearing stories of people who are living fat, dumb, and happy. And I'll tell you what, when you live in Lincoln Hills, it's easy to live fat, dumb, and happy. All right? Life was good. But now... We've all dealt with an unseen enemy that we'd never seen before. We don't understand it. We know very little about it. All we know is it's killed close to a million people in the United States. And if that hasn't begun to make people stop and think about life, particularly at the age that all of us are, I don't know what does. But in the midst of it all, it's made a lot of us begin to search about how to get closer to God. And that's a great thing. I don't know who you might be here today, but I hope you're close enough to the Lord that, that you realize he's working in your life. You don't have to be afraid of anything. No. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. To him be glory in the church by Jesus Christ forever and ever. God's at work. God's at work in your life. He's at work in our community. He's at work in our country. He's at work in the nation. He's at work in the world. What man thinks of as opposition and obstacle, God uses as opportunity. Philippians 2.13, Paul writes this, and we'll see it as we get to that later on. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. In the midst of all this, here's the question, the takeaway question for us. What purposes does God will to work in and through your life in this year, 2022? That's a good question to ask. Because what God does, he does with people. And what God wants to do, he wants to do with us.
what does he want to do with your life? I love the statement, and we'll close with that, James 4, 8. It simply says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I hope all of this time in these last couple of years, it's made all of us draw closer to the Lord. I hope that it has. That's a good thing. And that's God working in our lives. He wants to be able to bring you to this table. This is a table that's all about remembering <laughs> on a night and a day when seemingly to the disciples, the world had fallen apart. But it's all about what God did that day and six hours on a cross and three days later when the tomb was empty just for you and for me. He invites you to come to this table today. If you've invited Christ into your life, if you've said, Lord, I believe, I don't ever understand everything, but I want you in my life, I believe, I repent, I come to you, he welcomes you. He enters into your life. And the life that you now live, you live by faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself for you. And this morning as we gather this table, we invite you to join be part of God's family with us. As Jody read for us a little while ago today in that upper room the night before Jesus was crucified, uh, they were gathered for a Passover. It would be the last Passover and the first Lord's table. And down through the centuries, believers, it doesn't matter what stripe we are, we may practice it in many different ways, but we all come around this table, it's a time of remembering what God has done. And so this morning as we prepare, let's remember that that, that night in that upper room, he broke bread and he offered the cup. The bread, he said, is my body which is given for you, the cup is a symbol of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. In all this, he said, the Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. And then it says, as long as you drink this cup and break this bread, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we're going to do today. When we pass this out to you today, you'll have a little kit there. And uh, we'll walk you through that. And uh, we will partake together. I'm going to ask if Pastor Jody would uh, lead us in prayer as we prepare to take the bread and the cup. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and call us your children. We thank you for the blessings we've seen today and the hope that we have tomorrow through Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, we would tell you thank you for the gift of your offering for us. We thank you that you shed your blood for the forgiveness of our sin and that you gave your body that to be re resurrected three days later. So Heavenly Father, let us not walk away from this table without, without making amends to you and bringing your name in the glory of the Lord. Amen. For we ask these things in Jesus' most precious name. Amen.
haven't done that already, you can peel that little cellophane back and that will expose the wafer. Jesus said, of this bread, it's symbolic of my body. Give it for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And that same time, and you can peel that foil back, and exposing the cup. Jesus said, this cup is my blood. It's symbolic of that, of the new covenant, the new relationship, the new friendship you have with God because my blood is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as you remember me. Now, if you will pass your baskets to the right, our folks will come and pick them up from you. And I have the joy now of being able to introduce to you some new folks, part of our church. We do that when we gather around the table. We like to welcome and give the right hand of fellowship. Incidentally, I've had people say, what's the right? I remember teenagers in my last church wondering, what is the right hand of fellowship? And I always thought, one of these days, I'm going to get a fake arm and put it in my coat sleeve so that, never in mind. <laughs> it's a biblical phrase for welcome. So I want to welcome these folks as we, I call your name. If you'd come and join me up here today, I have a name tag for you. Howard Beaumont. Howard, come on up. Good to have you here, Howard. Here it comes, Howard. And if you just join me up here, there you go, Howard. Welcome, brother. And uh, Karen Boulay. Karen, if you'd come. Welcome to you, Karen. If you'd I'm come, it. yeah, you're official here now. That way you won't forget who you are. Right. <laughs> and then Cheryl Kane. And right along with her, Larry Redman, the two of you. If you would come. All right. Cheryl, God bless you. It's great to have you here. Larry, there we go. Whoops. That's all right. My, my bad. <laughs> and then Lori Morales. Let's see, where is Lori this morning? I see her. Here she comes. Lori. There you go. God bless you. Good to have you here. And Rich Walker. There's Rich. Here he comes. All right. God bless you, my brother. Thank you. Welcome. Now, these folks have all come through our welcome class and uh, shared their faith and have been coming and want to be part of us. If you're happy to have them part of us, you say amen. Amen. All right. It's great to have you all here. And I'm going to ask you when we close, don't run away because I know people want to just say hello to you. But uh, let's stand together and uh, we can get a picture of them when we're done here. Okay. And uh, we're going to sing that song, The Bond of Love. We are one in the bond of love because that's what this is about. That's what it is to be part of this community of faith. And uh, I hope, you know, that if you've been coming here, been coming for a while. I hope you see something very genuine here. We'd love to have you as part of our community. And uh, just uh, it's the Lord that unites us all. Let's sing together. For this morning. Thank you, Father, for the challenge that uh, our two friends, Steve and Don, have given to us. Thank you for the work they're doing. And oh, Lord, how we pray for them as they, uh, they endeavor new ministries. We pray for their daughters as they're finishing at Taylor University. Uh, all the many things that go with change. But I thank you so much, Father, for their example to all of us. And to each one here today, 
Let us respond to the challenges of these days by fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter, the captain and the coach of our faith. For it's in his magnificent name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. And take some time to come up and greet these folks. Amen.